Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Jonathan Binstock. I'm the director of the Memorial Art Gallery. Welcome to our virtual Marion Stratton Gould Society lecture. I'm so glad you're here. It is a beautiful day outside, but it's a beautiful day inside too, especially with Nancy Norwood and what she will share with us this afternoon. I'm sorry, uh, still sorry we can't be together in person, but something tells me that is just around the corner. Lots of good news coming. Uh, in regards to our success in managing the COVID-19 virus here in New York State. And I cannot wait to be enjoying these presentations in person, accompanied by a little bit of lunch, perhaps, um, informal chit chat, and all the rest of it, all the pleasure, all the joy that comes from being together in person. So I really look forward to that day. In the meantime, Thank you again for joining us. And, um, and thank you for your support of the Memorial Art Gallery. Let me share with you a few brief housekeeping items for today. We have a live captioner with us. If you would like to have captions on your screen, you may click the closed captioning CC button at the bottom of your screen. After today's presentation, there will be time to answer questions that you've submitted. Please submit your questions at any time throughout uh, the uh, program using the Q&A button or the comment box. At the end of the webinar, uh, we will email you a short survey about your experience. Please let us know what you think. We are always eager to hear from you. and. Uh, and always eager to learn about how we can do things better at the MAG. As members of our Marion Stratton Gould Society, you have demonstrated a deep and lasting commitment to our city's art museum. When the MAG received its first endowment in 1930, the donor, Mrs. Hannah Duran Gould, had a vision to sustain the gallery for future generations. And we are lucky beneficiaries of her generosity today. I should say lucky. Uh, I should also say fortunate and, 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 and grateful uh, beneficiaries of her generosity. It is through the stewardship of so many other people, many other directors, many, many board members, generations of people who truly love this organization that we are here today in enjoying the benefits, the largesse, and the kindness of past donors like Mrs. Gould. Your vision and generosity through your planned gifts will have a lasting impact at the museum, just as uh, Mrs. Gould's generosity did. Uh, sustaining us through challenging times, like what we've been experiencing in recent uh, months, uh, and, and, and for that and so much more, we could not be more grateful to you. Please know uh, how appreciative we all are at the gallery, how I am personally for your dedicated support. It's truly meaningful and it is a gift to this community because we have a wonderful museum, a strong museum, and one that will be here serving the community for generations to come. Now with that, I hope you will join me in welcoming Nancy Norwood, the Memorial Art Gallery's Curator of European Art and today's speaker. I'll be back in a few minutes when Ma Nancy is done. So thank you very much for joining us. Nancy? Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm really excited to be able to present this very special preview of our upcoming holiday show, Renaissance Impressions, um, 16th Century Prints from the Kurt Long Collection. And I'm going to share my screen now. Um, so this show is um, actually from the American Federation of the Arts, um, but there's a special sort of twist to it, which we have um, we are adding some of our own work to the show that um, are the decorative arts from the Renaissance. And I think, I think you'll be very surprised because this is a really rare opportunity to see this sort of imagery um, 
in in person because you know when we think of the Renaissance, we think of religious painting or um, classicizing sculpture, um, but we don't think of the the sort of dynamic really forceful, vibrant imagery that um, is present in these prints. And one of one of the reasons for that is um, Kurt Long's taste. And, you know, and so we 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 will see the prints and the, how phenomenal they are, but we also sort of see the taste of a collector. Um, so I'm really excited about this show coming and I think you will be too. Um, so I just want to sort of give you a little behind the scenes. One thing that we always do with an exhibition is we we come up with a golden nugget. And what that golden nugget is, is two or three sentences that everybody in the institution works from. So we all sort of know exactly what the exhibition is about. So this one explores the emergence and transformative impact of the print medium on the visual culture of Renaissance Europe. It showcases the extraordinary technique, imagery, and imagination of the master printmakers of the time. And then this is what um, we're doing that's very special, which we're interspersing throughout the exhibition works that highlight the surprising interconnections between this new print medium and painting, stained glass, ceramics, and armor that are in Mag's permanent collection. And when I told um, Bernard Berthe, who's the organ, he's Mr. Long's private curator, um, and then AFA, they were very excited about this because the arts in this period are so intertwined. Um, and it's, a, it's really an opportunity to explore that even more um, because it's really kind of the first global medium um, that allowed sort of the transmission of imagery across Europe. So I wanna give you a little bit of background um, on Renaissance print, printmaking in terms of the history and the technique. So it was really in the, in the West, um, the late 15th and particularly the 16th centuries when printmaking became incredibly popular and it wasn't just sort of um, a lower art form, it really developed very quickly and um, as a technique and, and sort of the prowess of printmakers and also the status of printmakers, especially the masters. Um, so, and then you had, you know, painters who were also exploring the printmaking medium, people like Albrecht Dürer, for example, in Germany, he's one of the most famous printmakers of this period. Um, a lot of that, you know, a lot of it always, it always has to do with practical things. And um, one of them was the widespread availability of paper. The first paper mills opened in Germany and Italy around 1390. So you can't, if you think about it, you can't really make prints without paper. And so when it's plentiful, um, you know, there's, there's a lot more capacity for that. Um, and artists really, liked the printmaking medium because they could experiment and they could reproduce paintings. So it allowed them both creativity um, sort of seen beyond because prints could be actually made without a, a client or without a commission, um, direct commission, but it could also reproduce the famous paintings of the time, which was a financial benefit. So, um, and then when you have collectors, you have this new art market that developed in response to the greater availability and the reduced cost of prints. And so you even get um, print dealers emerging and even auctions. So it changed the whole art market scene, you know, to one that is not unfamiliar today. So then I wanted to talk a little bit about the techniques that emerged. Um, these techniques were all Oh, the primary ones are woodcuts, engravings, and etchings. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but then the other thing that sort of links these um, is their subject matter. So we have allegory, um, which is a story, image, or other work in which characters and events represent particular qualities or ideas that relate to morals, religion, or politics. Um, scenes from faith. So we have not only scenes from the Old and New Testaments, but we also have um, images of saints and the lives of saints. And then one thing that was really very, very important in the Renaissance was um, artists were looking at the classical world and not only artists, but philosophers, um, educated people, um, they were looking at, you know, imagery too, and they were looking at coins and gems, architecture, sculpture, and then they were very interested in the mythology and history of Greek and Roman literature. 
Um, and they, it really fascinated the class, the educated classes of Renaissance Europe. And, and so a lot of these prints, you know, that this was relatively new um, in terms of the subject matter. So, you know, there were, there were these, you know, allegory had been around, faith had been around, but really this, this sort of boom in the class, interest in the classical world had a huge impact on the medium. So just very quickly on technique, um, I just wanted to, because it's, it's important to know how things are made. Um, so with a woodcut, you have the, the artist carves an image and relief into a block of wood. And then when ink is applied to the block, the raised areas hold the most ink and the images then transferred onto paper from those raised images. Um, this Albrecht Durer, who I mentioned before, this is one of his most famous prints, which is the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. And you can really tell how, um, you know, dynamic this is and vibrant with the, you know, the figures. You have the Four Horsemen, this is in the Book of Revelation in the New Testament. Um, but, you know, he really takes the subject matter and makes it, he animates it, you know, in, in this print. And so, um, but he was, he was wonderful at woodcuts. And then you had this experimentation, and this is really quite new, where you have the Chiaroscuro woodcut, um, which was first introduced in the early 16th century. And that involved printing an image from two or more wood blocks that were inked in different hues. So it was really an experimental um, new foray into color printing in Europe. And um, it takes its name from the Italian for light and shade um, because the technique creates the illusion of depth through these tonal contrasts. And again, these are all prints that are in the exhibition. So you can really see how you, you get the sense of color even though it's from four, four different blocks with different um, emphasis. So there are a few of these, um, they're pretty rare and there are a few of them in the show, which is great. Um, and then you have engravings, which originated, um, I mean, one thing I think that's important to remember is that these techniques um, really originated in other things. So that with engraving, it originated in goldsmithery, where you incise a design onto a metal plate with a, a burin, which is a little cutting tool. And that creates um, a groove in the metal that traps the ink and the tone and the shading can be suggested by making parallel lines or cross hatching. And this is an example um, by one of the best engravers of the period named um, Hendrik Goltius, a Dutch artist who was also a painter. And you can see how he was able to achieve these tones. I mean, he was really a master at this um, in terms of the musculature and everything else. And when you think about it, this is all done with line, it's just, it's really an extraordinary um, thing. This is the God Apollo, who's the sun God. So you can see, you know, here's his, um, here's the sun behind his head. And so again, you know, we have this real interest in, in classical imagery. And then an etching finally is um, a process in which the composition, it sounds scarier than it is. Um, the composition is drawn with a needle onto a wax or a resin coated metal plate, which is then soaked in acid. And that corrodes the exposed lines of the design and um, leaves the coating intact. The etching techniques were originally used for decorating armor and other metal objects. And then with the advent of paper, of a plentiful supply of paper. Um, and, you know, painter printmakers, really, Parmigianino was a painter first and foremost, but they were able to achieve a much more um, a softer palette, if you want to call it that, with etching than with engraving, even though it's still lying at the, the coating will soften that appearance. And then you get, like with the Cherusky woodcut, you get this experimentation where artists um, were actually combining techniques. So you have etching and engraving in this fantastic image of, um, of an aviary, but you have this, these are, again, you know, you have these musicians here, you have the skeleton emerging. Um, so death is emerging into this garden scene. And, you know, this is really not drawn from um, any, this is, this is imagination at work. Um, so again, this is on the show. So now I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the individual prints and there are 82 prints in the show from the long collection. Um, 
there's not a bad one in the show, so it was really hard to choose today, but um, but I thought I would just sort of look at the breadth of it. So the first section um, are the allegorical images. This is one of this is one of the my my favorite prints in the show, um, which shows the figure of wisdom conquering ignorance. So in the center here, you have the goddess Minerva, who's the goddess of wisdom. So it's an allegory, but it's also using classical figures. So there's a lot of combination of the subject matter. And you can see she's stepping here on the neck of this very foreshortened figure. Um, who's representing ignorance. So it's this triumph scene and ignorance is represented, you know, it's ignorance from the, um, the goats here. here. They're, so they all have what are called attributes, um, which allow you to allow the viewer to sort of um, recognize who, who these individuals are. So Minerva is recognized by her helmet and her wings. And um, so that's, clear. And then um, one thing that's really extraordinary is the um, the images here. So the, all of these figures represent the arts and sciences. Um, and here you have the figure holding an astrolabe. So that's astronomy. Here, this figure is holding um, the tools of the architect. You have sculpture, the figure of sculpture here holding the figure of, of um, a sculpted of the classical goddess series. And this is painter, painting, a figure of painting. Um, and then you have this very interesting figure of Cleo, who's the muse of history. And what she's writing in the um, caption here, she's broken the frame um, and she's writing in the caption, the Latin for the ignorant will not be honored. So it's very much a triumph scene, but it's also one of these, you know, it it's really characterizes a lot of these prints that are crowded and dynamic. And, you know, there's um, the figures are so expressive, the faces. And when you think about all of this is done with line, I mean, it's uh, line and ink. It's, um, you know, it's, it's, I think that's always an important thing to remember. Um, and then you have this, this extraordinary um, allegory of death and fame. And this is one of the more enigmatic prints in the um, show. So it, it's actually quite debated as to what the real subject matter is. So here you have a skeleton. So you look for your clues. So you have a skeleton with a book. Um, it's a winged skeleton. And then you have this skeleton prone on the ground. Then you have this very strange sort of hermaphrodite figure. Then you have these cadaverous figures. And then again, you know, it's all very, very crowded around. So one interpretation, um, and you know, it's 500 years and we're still discussing it 600 years later, um, is that this is death having a debate with philosophy about, um, about this dead soul down here, um, or it's, the devil or death holding the book of judgment again talking about this dead soul here and then this could be the figure of um of philosophy and then this figure perhaps of envy because this is how envy is often shown with the flowing hair out the back and then you have all of these other figures just peering onto this very very macabre scene um this figure kneeling down um it's really a fascinating print and some of the best minds of the last three centuries haven't been able to figure it out, but it's just wonderful to look at and sort of, you know, imagine what else it could be. Um, death was a big subject. Um, this is a vanitas or the title of it, which is down here, made mortal, she must stop it. Um, and it refers to a line by the ancient Roman poet Horus. Um, that all mortal things must perish. And so what you have here, and this is um, quite common in terms of a, of a allegory of death or a banitas image where you have the nude woman or a woman, even if not nude, admiring herself in a mirror, admiring her reflection. And then you have the figure of death, which here is a skeletal form. Um, peering, and in this one, he's smirking at her because he knows that she's just, with her vanity, she's doomed herself to death, her soul to death. 
And here, this hourglass represents time. And it looks like he's just getting ready to flip it over um, to start the descent of her time. And then um, the other images you have here is the Wheel of Fate, the Wheel of Fortune, which determines everyone's future. And then you have this very strange wing, um, which again um, is projected to be a sign of classical mythology, where it's the broken wing that um, doesn't allow a soul to be immortal. That's the, um, it's again from Socrates. So, and then another very enigmatic but powerful print um, comes from the Italian printmaker Musi. And it's one of, again, it's sort of like the allegory of death that we saw before. It's one of the most discussed, discussed prints. Um, and I think everyone agrees it has to do with witchcraft, um, but exactly what it's saying is not really clear. But again, you look here, so you have your witch here riding a skeletal carriage. So it's a procession and it's led by these beautiful nude young men who are the perhaps the souls, the doomed souls running. They're leading the procession though. And then you have these goats and sort of monstrous goats with these monstrous feet. And they were always, um, they were very symbol symbolic of Satan and witchcraft. Um, and then with these very strange figures on the back. And then here's, this is the witch here riding her chariot, um, which is a skeleton, in the form of a skeleton. She's holding this cauldron. And then there are all of these infants trapped in the, in the ribs of the skeletal chariot. And then her hair, so a lot of times witchcraft was associated with um, very bad weather. So here her hair is blowing out like all the way, you know, sort of synonymous with cloud forms and the wind. So it's just an extraordinary print. And uh, I could look at this one all day, but if you look at just the, the detail in this, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. And you know this, these sort of macabre images um, weren't limited to allegory or to these sort of fantastic scenes. Um, this one is referring to um, the vision of Ezekiel, who was an Old Testament prophet, and he was instructed to go. Um, he had many visions, but one of them he was instructed to go to the Valley of Dry Bones, and. So then he was instructed to speak to the bones um, and then the bones came together to form full bodies again. So the way that he has represented this is really interesting because as I mentioned, there is this huge interest in classical architecture at the time. So you have this sort of classical architectural setting with these classical statues. But then you have these broken bones everywhere. You have the skulls up here, you have the broken skeletons here. So he's really represented the dry bones, the valley of the dry bones in, in a very sort of literal way. Um, and then you have the, here's the two, um, two skeletons that have come together. But then you also have um, sort of the continuation of the, of the vision where the skeletons actually sort of, they start developing muscle and sinew and, and skin again. So that's the um, prophetic vision that, but the way that it's illustrated and then when these sort of classical putti figures up here, um, it's just a really wonderful representation of how the imagery and the dynamism and the vibrancy um, that are occurring in the 16th century in this time, um, it's translated across all of the subject matter, the genres of subject matter. And again, you have, um, this is a New Testament scene, but it's also it's set in classical architecture where you have um, this form here. This is um, a scene of the massacre of the, innocence, of the innocents in the New Testament where um, according to the, um, the story the Herod, King Herod has any boy ch child under two um, murdered in order to uh, try to murder Jesus. 
um, after his birth. And so what you have here, I mean, there are lots of ways this is represented. It's been represented ever since, um, you know, people started painting. It's a very, very important story in the New Testament for Christianity. But here you have, again, this just incredibly dynamic where you have these, um, these nudes of soldiers ripping the babies away from the mothers and the tragic faces here. Um, you know, it's just, there's movement everywhere. And it's just really, um, you know, it really does, again, it sort of summarizes all of the characteristics of the prints of this time, or most of them. And then you have this wonderful print of, um, from Albrecht Durer, who's one of my favorite printmakers, um, of the scene of the harrowing of hell, which um, is from the apocryphal gospel of Nicodemus, who um, that isn't really included in the New Testament anymore, but it, um, so Jesus was crucified on Friday and resurrected on Sunday. Um, in between those two times, he descended into hell to bring the righteous souls who were born before him, um, before he, his resurrection or his presence on earth, um, to bring them out and so that they too could um, become righteous souls again. So here he's he's bringing, this is um, a very, you know, common subject. It's, it's actually illustrated more in um, Eastern Christianity than Western. Um, it's often used as a substitute for the resurrection. But this is the figure of Jesus kneeling here. Um, over here, you have Adam and Eve. Here, this is Eve here, this is Adam. Um, who, so the first man and first woman in the Bible who were um, thrown out of the garden um, have a second chance, basically. And then this is the figure of John the Baptist. And again, you know, there are always these clues. So John the Baptist is usually represented with a beard and a hair shirt. So we know that th that's what's happening here. Um, and then the interesting thing is that Durer has created all of these monsters that are threatening um, Jesus while he's, you know, engaged in this very, very dangerous pursuit. And um, one thing that Durer actually wrote, because so many of his, um, his prints are just filled with these, um, these sort of monsters, or what he called dream work. Um, and he said, he actually wrote that if you wanted to create a dream work, you could mix together every kind of creature. Um, and that's what he often did. And then um, this is an interesting sort of thing to think about in terms of the art market, because a lot of prints, as I mentioned, they were, you know, this exploration and creativity, but there was also financial um, benefit to be derived. And this is um, the Raft of Sharon. So you see the ferryman who's ferrying the doomed souls across the river to hell. Um, we know from the inscription that it's based on, it's written right here, um, Michelangelo's um, fresco in the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican that was completed um, just two or three years before he made this print. So very contemporary with it. And a lot of printmakers were doing what they called reproductive prints. So they were taking very, very famous paintings mostly um, and then creating multiples of them. So taking the work of other artists, making prints, and then more people could afford. Um, I mean, I don't think that a poor person could buy this print, but someone, you know, you're not going to be able to commission a fresco in the Sistine Chapel if you're just a regular person. So. Um, or anything but the Pope really. So you could have this reproduction. So what he used was, so this is an, this is the Sistine Chapel, um, the last judgment that Michelangelo painted. Um, and then this image is right down here. So that's all there is to it. Um, and so he took that and marketed it as you know an example, but he did it. A, he did a detail, and another very interesting thing about this is that in the um, so that was painted in the 1540s, and then the print contemporary with that. But in the 1560s, the Pope, if you look at the figures here, you can see they're um, actually 
much more um, much neuter in a way, like especially, for example, this figure here. And it's now somewhat clothed because the Pope was so offended by the nudity and so uncomfortable. And he said, we have to get rid of that. So it was actually um, a lot of the more what he felt were egregious scenes were obliterated. And so because this print was made so contemporary to the, the fresco, we actually get a stronger sense of you know, what Michelangelo really painted in the beginning right before it was covered up because there's not really any documentation of that. So this is actually a, a really important print for a lot of reasons. Um, and then finally, the classical world, I'm just gonna check my time. Um, the classical world was also very important. And this is a, these two are from a series of six, um, what they are called grotesques. And that relates to a term that was used in the Renaissance. And it's, you know, things that are sort of misshapen and it, grotesques were actually not seen as great things in the classical period, but they were, um, they were certainly there. And they were really, I think, um, artists loved to do them because again, it allowed that creativity. So here we have these, um, this is the goddess Diana and she's shown here with her hunting dog. And then all of the motifs around her relate to her. Um, so you have these two figures, you have the stag, she's the huntress. Um, and then you have all of these embellishments and Renaissance ornament. And a lot of times this Renaissance ornament is what will wind up on say metal work. Um, so it will be translated into another medium by another artist who was looking at these prints. And then on the right, you have Venus, the, um, the goddess Venus, and she's shown here with Cupid, which is pretty much part of the course. And then some of it's a little bit confusing because um, Venus is not usually associated with snakes. That's where the artist really, I think, gets creative. And then you have these two um, sort of, I don't want to say offensive, but it's certainly an element of play where you have these two figures here um, with this orb and they're in the process of passing gas. So that's, um, there's always a lot of humor in these grotesques. It really allows for the ex artistic exploration, but also for, you know, collectors to have things that, you know, are sort of making comments or accessible. It sort of shows the erudition. And um, so you, you get, you get a real sense of how these prints were used and, and enjoyed and what the how the imagery was was translated. And then finally, um, for the prints in the show, I wanted to end with this one because it's it's really shows the kind of globalization um, of all of this. And one thing, you know, prints were very transportable. So you had and people were traveling. So you had, for example, um, you know, this is a print by a German artist who is doing the print after a design that was commissioned by the French king, um, Francis I. And he commissioned the Italian artist, um, Giulio Romano, to develop a series of designs for a set, a very elaborate set of tapestries. And um, that really looked at the successful battle of. Um, for the new Carthage. And, you know, he, Romano probably had no idea what that looked like. So he's using the model of a, of a Roman um, building. And again, you have all of this activity taking place. All of these soldiers are scaling the walls. They're, you know, up in here. It's very successful. You get this incredible use of, um, you know, dimensionality. I mean, the just Again, you know, this is all with a line. This is all digging into a metal plate. Um, the other thing that's really amazing about this is how big it is. It's about a foot tall and two feet wide, which is huge for a print at this period. And um, so I think it's just, and you know, the question is where did Pence see these designs by this Italian for this French king? And it was probably when he traveled himself to Rome. So you again, you know, you have, for example, 
Albrecht Durer is going to Italy and you have Italian artists coming north to the Antwerp and the big publishing centers were in Antwerp and they were in Nuremberg and they were in Rome. And so there was just a lot of portability of imagery and um, sort of inter, you know, the, the arts, you can't look at these and sort of immediately say, oh, well, that's Italian or that's German. I mean, there's so much crossover. So, um, so and this really permeates all 82 prints, but obviously we couldn't get through 82 today. But I just wanted to give you sort of a sense of the flavor of um, what will be in the show. And the other thing we're doing that's really unique um, that I mentioned before was we're going to be integrating works in the collection and that are in all media. So armor, um, those of us who know our Brunswick armor will be bringing that down into the docent gallery. Um, stained glass, some of which are new acquisitions, ceramics, cabinetry, and then textiles from our collections of Renaissance art. And all of them had used prints as source images. So that's another thing is how prints actually created a whole new language for the decorative arts and also for painting at times. So um, for example, with the armor, there is this book that was contemporary with the argon armor on uh, um, biblical figures of the Old Testament. So if you look here, you see this is um, image of the birth of Eve, and this is Adam and Eve. There's the Adam Garden of Eden with the serpent. And you have um, that image is directly drawn um, from this book by Virgil, this Bible by Virgil Solis, which an armory shop would have had access to easily. Um, and it, again, it was contemporary. So they were using, they were immediately using these source images for um, decorating armor. So this is just so you can see close up. So this was, this plate was stricken out, but you have, so here's God the Father, right? And then you have Adam sleeping, here he is. And then you have this tiny woman, Eve, being pulled out from his, Adam's rib. So it's a very literal translation. And then you, you know, he's obviously changed. I mean, one thing that really interests me is how, how these images are 2D when they're prints, but they're being applied to often three-dimensional objects. And so they, the, the artist, the person who's actually creating the other work has to be very creative about, um, about how that 2D translates into 3D. And we see that here, um, this is our wonderful Limoges Tassa, uh, which is basically a covered dish and it's decorated with scenes from the um, book of Genesis. And so example, again, you know, you have this contemporary book um, that was published in France at about the same time um, in 1553. And again, it was used as the source material for this. So here you have um, you have Adam and Eve fleeing. They've they've eaten the apple. Here they are fleeing. It's in reverse. And but you have it again. It's applied to a three dimensional object. And so it's just it's really interesting how the artist has made use of it. And it's it's an incredibly beautiful rendition of the imagery in this print. Um, you also have, for example, these grotesques. If you'll think back to those two prints that I showed earlier, a lot of times, you know, there was a lot of mixing of imagery. There are no grotesques in this book, but there are certainly grotesques in other prints that artists would have seen. Um, another area that we have is stained glass, and this is a new acquisition that um, you'll be seeing for the first time in the show that was given to us um, by one of our very generous members of your society and Mark Chaplin and John Starway. Um, and so what you have is this beautiful, again, this print by Albrecht Durer, um, which is the Virgin and Child with a monkey. And it's very clear that this scene of the Virgin and Child is drawn from this print, but the monkey isn't there. So we're, you know, so again, but you still have the building to some extent. And um, what the artist has done, what the glass artist has done, is taken a print by the Italian Raimondi in the 1520s, The Dance of the Cupids, and he's put these three little cupids almost exactly, literally, you know, 
pulled from this print. So he's really combining these source images um, to create something new. So it's not just sort of lifting imagery and applying it. And then finally, we have um, this is the painting um, by Ubertini, The Conversion of Saul, where Saul is struck by, here's, this is God the Father up here, and here's, um, here's Saul before he becomes St. Paul, where he is converted on the road to Damascus. Um, and so you have all of these figures, and what Ubertini was really known for was using a, lots and lots of different prints to call um, his source imagery, and we'll be exploring this a lot more in the show when we bring the painting down. But just as an example, if you look, um, for example, again, this is a Durer print. Um, he was probably the most, one of the most famous print artists um, of the six, early 16th century. But you have these weird rock, these very unique, we'll call them, rock formations here. Well, he's pulled those and he's put them in his painting. But you have other things like with the shield and with the horse that are pulled from other prints. So Ubertini has actually in a very masterful way taken these images and put them together to create something new. Um, and then, you know, it is an act of creativity, very much so. And if you think about um, those of you who saw the um, Judas Schechter exhibition, how Judith uses imagery from the Im internet. She pulls all these images off and then creates her own. That's really quite similar to what was going on in the 16th century with printmaking. Um, so that's just a little bit of a taste of what we're gonna be doing. For the programming, um, it will be pretty robust. We're gonna have the opening lecture on November 13th by the exhibition curator, Bernard Berthe. Um, I'll be giving a lecture and tours throughout and then uh, we just found out it's quite possible we're going to get funding from the your U of R Humanities Project for study day for faculty and students. And um, hopefully we can open that up to some extent to the general public. And then the creative workshop classes um, are going to be offering classes in printmaking and um, in Renaissance art history. We're also developing um, sort of intergenerational activities for within the gallery. Um, we'll have a printed family guide with activities and information. Um, those of you who saw the Monet exhibition will be using those touchscreen kiosks again to sort of do deep dive explorations of images and subject matter. Um, we'll have choose like four prints and four of our decorative art so that people can really explore and then um, and it sounds a little mundane, but we're also going to have magnifying glasses um, because that way people can really look at prints. Um, we're having a video made by a U of our faculty member um, in our department demonstrating printmaking technique. And then we're going to have hands-on interactives that um, are really designed to introduce all generations to basics of printmaking. So I think it's going to be a very exciting show and um, it's certainly geared for the holidays. And um, and that's what I have for you today. And so I'd be happy to take any questions at all. Um, I think Jonathan is going to come back. I uh, do want to thank you for your wonderful presentation. I, um, every time I hear you speak about this exhibition, I become more and more excited about it. The work is so fantastical, so engaging so interesting and complicated and mysterious and uh, quite brutal, <laughs> really. You know, it's hard not to be utterly transfixed and I, I, for me, uh, I'm mesmerized. Um, you know, for those of us who think that, um, well, traditional art is all light and uh, sweet and pretty. Um, well, it is pretty. The work is stunning, but it is intense and it's very dense and um, at times very tough. Uh, what I also love about this project is how it's going to enable us to highlight our collection, our wonderful permanent collection. We get to bring things down from upstairs, make, um, draw attention to the wonderful works in our collection highlight the collection and 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 paint a, a bigger picture as it were of visual culture 
in the time period of, of, the, of, of our focus here. It's also a wonderful way to highlight our recent acquisitions. And uh, you shared at least one uh, from Mark uh, Chaplin and John Strawway, which we're especially grateful for. And it will look wonderful in this context. So um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that folks will ask questions. I, I have a couple of questions that I would like to ask because, um, well, just because I'm curious. Um, there's so much nudity in these pictures, Nancy. It seems that everybody's naked. What is going on? Why does everybody have to be naked? Well, I think that there was um, a lot of it, you know, there are a lot of different explanations for that. But I mean, if you'll remember back to that one print that's taken um, from the, the Sistine Chapel fresco by Michelangelo, um, obviously not everyone was comfortable with nudity because, you know, the sort of storyline is that, oh, everybody in the Renaissance was really comfortable with nudity. And that's not really true. Um, but artists were looking back and they were looking at classical statues. They were looking at, at nudes. I mean, if you look at our own collection, there are a lot of nude figures in the ancient gallery. Um, so there was this resurgence of interest in that. And I think that was one, one reason for all the, figure, nu the nudity. Um, also, there was a real interest in um, anatomy. The medical profession was changing a lot. Um, one training device was people would draw um, art students. They would get bodies from um, physicians and draw those. And so they would really be able to learn about musculature. And so you, you have, um, even in our own medical library here at U of R, you have some amazing anatomical treaties from this period. Um, I don't know if Schwartz used to talk about that. So I just think there was, you know, between the classical literature and looking at classical art and people traveling more and seeing these things, arts in particular, I think that that explains a lot of it. Um, Hmm. And not everything had, you know, I mean, sort of more traditional religious prints that people used for devotion were not necessarily filled with nudes. So, so uh, is what, is this a good example? Are the, are, are these works good examples of how art and science are so interrelated at the time? Um, it, it, would that be true thing to think or say? I think, I think that you know, the, the whole sort of, I mean, it's a sort of a 19th century construct, but this whole idea of humanism, this, re, this sort of rebirth, which Renaissance means rebirth, but this real interested in a broader world, um, a world of literature, a world of philosophy, a world of, you know, medicine was making huge advancements, science was making huge advancements, and, you know, bringing it all together um, so some things, yes, I think art and science, but some things also just the advance, the things that were advancing so rapidly in the 16th century, um, you know, very as various aspects of society, education, the growth of the middle class, I mean, all of these things. Um, yeah, and the printing press, of course, which uh, is a mid 15th century uh, invention. Um, so these pictures are being printed uh, and reproduced. Who, who are they for? Do you have any? Do well, have I think they're for, I think they're everyone. I mean, they're for, um, you know, not everyone could afford to commission a painting or commission a portrait. Um, there were other reasons for people to have multiples. Um, one of them was financial. So artists could sell more work um, and those works could be spread out. I think that um, people, you know, it varied. Some people would want a devotional print. Some people actually became collectors, you know, at the same time these things were being produced and printmakers were, you know, became very famous and, um, and their prints were highly sought after. And in terms of the reproductive prints, it was sort of a way of seeing a painting that maybe you didn't have very, like, like, Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel fresco. I mean, you had access to that. Mm -hmm. It was very famous, but you couldn't go see it, not, you know, just drop in at the Vatican. So I think there are a lot of, a lot of reasons for the popularity of prints. Mm. And I guess there were print sellers, right? There are people who, who de dealt in these things and... Yeah, that was a whole new development in the art market was um, there were dealers and there were workshops. And a lot of times artists 
would affiliate themselves with a particular dealer, um, a gallery, you know, that we would think of now. Um, and the dealer would be sort of responsible for, for marketing um, like they are now. And so it was that, that was really a fairly new profession um, in the, you know, that, that grew up around sort of with the development of prints. And um, I guess one final question uh, from me, um, the, the intensity of the emotions. I, I think of Renaissance art, you know, especially when it's, well, hmm, I can't say that, but classic high Renaissance art is often, um, people are very sort of calm and especially the religious figures of Mary. Um, uh, I think of Raphael, I think of, um, the, the, the Tondo by Michelangelo, where everybody's so serene and balanced and, uh, and there's nothing of that in this work. I mean, we saw, well, maybe some, but so much intensity, so much drama, so many intense facial expressions. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, part of it is that Mr. Long's collection is really focused on the late Renaissance. And um, it was a movement that we now call mannerism that's really, um, characterized by this dynamism and these elongated figures and um, this intensity of feature, a facial feature. I mean, you still do get certain types of things that are very calm, but I think, you know, this was also a way of showing of an artist and um, printmaker um, and painters too at the time, showing sort of their, their expert technique, you know, to really be able to represent emotion in a face like this um is saying a lot about yourself as an artist mm. so i think that was that was really a development that that then led into you know if you think of the traditional explanations of western art history that then led into this also incredible intensity of the baroque art period um in the 17th century so mm. well thank you nancy uh i think we're approaching the end of the hour here um, I'm super excited about this exhibition. It is our big holiday season exhibition. And our aim is to, is to help a very broad audience connect with this material. Um, people love television shows and movies and all kinds of games, uh, all kinds of things that have connections to uh, Renaissance culture, uh, uh, society, late medieval, and uh, we do hope to bring out some of those connections so that people can enjoy what they know they enjoy and also um, have an opportunity to experience firsthand the real thing, the source material, actual visual uh, images uh, from from this period. And, and it, it's not easy to come across Across, uh, and to bring to Rochester a great Renaissance exhibition. So this is a special opportunity. I'm very grateful, Nancy, for your expertise, your intellect, your work on this project, your presentation today. And uh, I'd like to remind everyone that uh, Bernard Barate will be lecturing at MAG, whether in real life or virtually, I think we have yet to figure out, um, on November 13th, 2021. So mark your calendar the curator of the exhibition and the collection and a past curator of the MAG will be here in Rochester with us uh, one way or another. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. If you, um, we will be sharing a recording of today's webinar later this week for those of you uh, who could not join us uh, right now uh, for this uh, experience. So, or for those of you who wanna see it again, you need more uh, grotesquerie and uh, drama in your life. Uh, you can watch Nancy's video. Keep an eye out for the email with a follow-up survey about your experience today, as well as the registration links for the upcoming events that we've been speaking about. Uh, remember your feedback is important to us. Keep us informed, tell us what you're thinking. And thank you all very much for joining us today. And above all, thank you for your dedication and your support. Uh, we really appreciate it at the Memorial Art Gallery. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.